Welcome to Beneath the Bible, where we're helping you dig deeper and uncover the world beneath the sacred book. Last week, we looked at an artifact called the Mesha Stella, which recounts the victories of Mesha, the king who united the polity of Moab. And while the artifact has a fascinating history and is important in and of itself, we also looked at how the account on the Mesha Stella compares to the same events described in the Bible in 2 Kings 3. You can check out that video here or read that chapter for yourself to get the background on today's video. It's going to be important for what we're talking about today. Now, to summarize, Mesha was the leader of Moab, and he's generally credited with bringing together the Moabites from a loose regional confederation to a more unified polity. During the 9th century BC, when this event took place, Moab was a vassal of the Kingdom of Israel. Mesha decides to rebel and stops paying tributes to Israel, which leads the Israelite King Joram, or Jehoram, to call on Judah and Edom to attack Moab with him. Everything seems to be going Israel's way. The Israelite alliance has laid waste to every Moabite city, and Mesha is trapped in the last remaining Moabite stronghold. Today, we're focusing on the confusing and really horrifying ending to this story. It's an event that isn't recorded on the Mesha Stella, but only in the Bible. And we want to warn you that this story involves child sacrifice, and we'll show some archaeological images of child interments that may be disturbing to some people. With that disclaimer, here's what happens with Mesha's sacrifice. After failing to break through the Edomite line with a battalion of 700 swordsmen, Mesha retreats to the city and, in desperation, sacrifices his firstborn son and heir on top of the city wall as a burnt offering. Now, as readers of the Bible, we would expect this to be a despicable and futile act by a foreign king to appease his false god. But instead, this sacrifice seems to work. We're told that a great wrath came against Israel, and they turned and went back to their own land. Mesha's life was spared, and he continued to rule over a united Moab that gained independence from Israel. Now, if all that's really confusing to you, you're not alone. This is a very challenging event to understand, especially given the efficacy of Mesha's sacrifice. It raises questions about the practice of child sacrifice in the ancient Near East, something that was resoundingly condemned in Israel, but was practiced by surrounding nations. It also raises theological questions. How did this sacrifice work cosmologically? Was Chemosh appeased by Mesha's sacrifice and drove away the Israelite coalition? Does this mean that Chemosh defeated Yahweh? And what about this wrath that drives Israel back to their homeland? Whose wrath was it? How is it manifest? And why did it so radically affect the outcome of this battle? Now finally, this outcome raises questions about the prophet Elisha's words to Joram that God would give him complete victory over the Moabites and the Israelite coalition would destroy all of their cities and fields. How should we view this prophecy that apparently did not come to pass? Did Elisha give a false prophecy? Did Elisha or Yahweh straight up lie to Joram? We'll dig into those questions and more now, starting with child sacrifice in the ancient Near East. One question this horrific act raises is how widespread was child sacrifice in the ancient world? Tragically, it seems to be fairly widely practiced, but it was concentrated within Phoenician cities and Phoenician colonies. It's not clear how old this custom was. Some later texts that describe the origin of the practice seem to perhaps be seeking older origin stories for what was a relatively recent development. Some of the texts read like, I read this who reported from somewhere else that a long time ago in Phoenicia, a king burned his son to this god and it worked, so that's why we do this nowadays. So, I would advise you to be wary about the historical value of particularly late texts that discuss child sacrifice, texts like Plutarch, Diodorus Siculus, and Philo of, Bi of Byblos. Um, these are interesting sources, and they may have some kernels of historical truth to them, but just be wary. They are not sources that would have necessarily seen or practiced child sacrifice firsthand. Other types of evidence are available that shed light on the different kinds of child sacrifice in the ancient world. In general, we see three different kinds of child sacrifice in the ancient world, a mulk or vow offering, a first fruit offering, and a crisis offering. Before we talk about the evidence for these kinds of sacrifice, I want to note that some scholars are questioning how widespread and how old the custom of child sacrifice was, and they're starting to reinterpret the evidence that we have. Given all the references to child sacrifice in the Hebrew Bible, it seems relevant enough in the Southern Levant for the Israelites to at least mention it. 
However, some scholars have suggested that uh, since infant mortality was so high in the ancient world, and some estimates put it as high as 50%, that we should expect large internments of neonates, even concentrations where they're all buried together. The scholar Paul Mosca has suggested some of these internments may be sacrifices, but that they may have been done in the case where a child was terminally ill or was clearly not going to survive for some reason or another. If this is the case, the sacrifice was performed to immortalize the child or transform it preemptively. The idea that was that if this child was going to die anyway, and they were going to be destined to eat mud in the afterlife for all of eternity, I might offer them to the gods in hopes that they find a better life hereafter. So with that said, most scholars agree that some form of child sacrifice did exist in the ancient world. So we're going to follow the work of Heath Durrell here. He has a good book on this subject and we'll put the details of it in the description if you want to read more. First are the so-called mulk offerings. There's a large body of literature on all of this and we aren't going to get into all of it here and now, but in summary, these offerings were made in fulfillment of a vow made to a deity. They're represented by the Tophet burial grounds found at sites like Carthage, Leptis Magna, Palermo, and several other sites. Mostly, though not exclusively, places that were Phoenician city-states or Phoenician colonies. At Carthage, as many as 20,000 such burials may have occurred from the 7th to the 2nd century BC, with the practice probably peaking in the 4th century. Osteological evidence suggests many of these burials were from third trimester babies, though some were postnatal, usually not older than six months. Other sites like Mogia seem to have almost exclusively early postnatal burials. The children were either cremated or sacrificed in fire, which damages and can shrink bones, which makes getting uh, accurate ages particularly difficult, and which is where some of the debate around these burials comes from. Inscriptions at these tofet mention these children as mulk offerings. Uh, there's debate about what this word means. There are some who say it's the god Moloch. There, this was uh, once a very popular theory that you may have heard before, but it's not really widely believed anymore. Some say it refers to the Punic word for king, Malk, uh, which again, this is not widely believed anymore. Most scholars agree this refers to a kind of vow, as in parents made a vow to the gods that if they were bestowed with some blessing or boon, they would in turn offer this child as fulfillment of the Malk, of the vow. Inscriptional evidence indicates these offerings could be either sons or daughters, and they could be firstborn or born later, didn't have to be a child of a specific gender or birth order. There is some archaeological evidence for this practice in the Southern Levant, but it typically dates to much later than the period we're looking at for Mesha's sacrifice, which was around the, the mid-9th century. Places like Megiddo, the Gezer High Place, and the Amman Airport Temple have all been cited as having evidence of child sacrifice. In those cases, all predate our period, but also, those assertions haven't really stood up to scrutiny. The Nebi Yunus inscription from modern-day Israel may point to this practice on the Israelite coast, but it's not really clear if the inscription is authentic or not. So, not only does this kind of sacrifice not fit the time period of Mesha's sacrifice, but also may not even be found geographically close to Moab or chronologically relevant. So, we can say this kind of sacrifice has really no bearing whatsoever on the Mesha account in 2 Kings 3. It's an entirely different kind of sacrifice than what Mesha does. The second kind of child sacrificial offering is a first fruits offering. This kind of offering is noted in the Bible, but it's not clear how widely it was practiced, if at all. We see in the Israelite law, like in Exodus 13 and Numbers 3, that the first offspring of every womb belongs to God. This includes people as well as animals. The firstborn animals are set aside to be sacrificed. So are the humans as well? We need to look at these passages in context to understand them better. Passages like Exodus 13 lead up to the prescription of the Passover ritual and give explicit mention of redeeming all the firstborn among your sons. The idea is that the firstborn sons are to be redeemed with a substitutionary sacrifice, a financial gift to the sanctuary of God, or through service as a Levite. Now, this is made clear, except in Exodus 22. In Exodus 22, verses 29 and 30, it doesn't say to redeem the firstborn. Instead, firstborn sons are lumped in with the firstborn animals that are to be sacrificed. Now, the idea behind first fruit offerings is that everything belongs to God. So with the offering, you are returning the first of your crop back to whom it belongs. In return, God blesses the rest of the crop. You offer the first portion of your grain or your first lamb, and in return, God blesses you with a bountiful harvest and many more lambs to come. 
This is at least what Proverbs 3 indicates. And even Jeremiah 2.3 draws on this by referring to Israel as God's first fruit. Again, in a world with high infant mortality, the idea of being blessed with many more children is a valid concern. But we see within the text that this was not widely practiced, beyond the places where God says human sacrifice is an abomination. We see in the text that some figures are mentioned as the firstborn, and firstborn sons, who clearly aren't sacrificed on the eighth day. As awful as it is to think about, scholars who study this tend to think that sacrifice of the firstborn was at times practiced among some Israelite groups. Yahwistic customs apparently weren't standardized until the Reformation efforts of kings like Hezekiah and Josiah. So some think that this was a locally, even if occasional, practice amongst some Yahwistic communities as a first fruits offering. What's codified in the Bible clearly does not demand or condone human sacrifice. But the sacrifice of the firstborn is noted in some other places, particularly in times of crisis. This is the third kind of child sacrifice we see in the ancient world. This is best attested in the so-called Incherly Trilingual. This text was originally on a stella and is now poorly preserved. The excavators believe it originally would have had a trilingual text with an Akkadian and Luvian version appearing over the preserved Phoenician text, which is the only extant text and in poor condition at that. It tells the story of a revolt during the time of tiglath pileser III and how the rebellion king offered a human sacrifice during his rebellion. We can see this in lines 11 to 15, which are the relevant lines for us. Note, this is a very fragmentary inscription, and certain words and phrases are not fully present. And what we have are suggestions by the translators. Now, a lot of public inscriptions in the ancient world are very formulaic, so scholars can often reconstruct them with some confidence, but this is not one of those kinds of inscriptions. We don't have a lot of evidence for this kind of thing. We don't really have a lot of public inscriptions that talk about child sacrifice. So, with the line, the king of Arpad sacrificed for the benefit of Hadad Melech and redeemed the human sacrifice, we should note that a lot of this phrase is debated, and it's not clear what it's really intended to say. Is Hadad Melech a deity, which is how this translation would present it, or is it a reference to a mulk offering to Hadad? So, while this passage may refer to human sacrifice, it isn't entirely clear that that is what's going on. Another frequently cited parallel for a sacrifice in time of crisis is the cleverly named Ugaritic text KTU 1.119.31, better known as an Ugaritic prayer for a city under siege. This is often cited as a parallel to Mecha's sacrifice as it seems to be a prayer to Baal that if he would deliver the city from a strong one at its gates, then the people will sacrifice to him. But again, recent research on this text suggests this isn't a great parallel either. Instead, the context is not a siege by a hostile foreign army, but apparently a natural disaster, an earthquake or tsunami that destroyed the Temple of Baal. The presence of the deity in his temple provided the city with innumerable blessings, so his presence needed to be preserved. If a hostile force, like say the deity Yam, were to attack it with a colossal wave or something, then drastic steps would need to be taken to ensure the continued presence of the deity, including a human sacrifice to ensure it. There are some apparent allusions to the Baal cycle in this text which would further strengthen such an interpretation. This isn't actually about sacrificing a human during a physical assault on the city, but rather a ritual with more cosmic implications. So these are the kinds of child sacrifice that we see attested in the ancient world. What can we say about Mesh's sacrifice in light of this evidence? We can say that Mesh's sacrifice is not a mulk offering because he has no vow he's fulfilling. It's not a first fruit offering. There's no indication of this in the text, and it seems highly unlikely that his wife gave birth to a child while the city was under siege. I guess it's not impossible, but it seems highly improbable. That means that Mesha's sacrifice seems to be a sacrifice made in a time of crisis. Mesha is doing the only thing he knows to do in a time of crisis. He's hoping to offer something of great value in hopes of getting direct divine intervention. Micah 6 indicates that an offering of the firstborn may evoke even Yahweh to act on behalf of the one offering the sacrifice. The other big question raised by this passage is how the efficacy of Mesha's sacrifice relates to Elisha's prophecy of Israel totally subduing Moab. Also, what do we make of the wrath that comes following the sacrifice? What was this wrath, and where or who did it come from? Now let's start by saying that this has been an interpretive issue for millennia. Scholars have gone around and around on this question, and we won't settle it now. But I think there are some answers that may be simultaneously more satisfying and more culturally rooted in the ancient Southern Levant than the other theories that have been put forward. We'll start by reviewing Elisha's prophecy. 
Joram summoned Elisha to prophesy for him when his coalition forces were stuck in the wilderness of Edom without water. At first, Elisha refuses, telling Joram to consult the prophets of his father and mother, Ahab and Jezebel. Eventually, Elisha agrees, but out of respect for King Jehoshaphat of Judah, not out of respect for Joram. Elisha summons a musician, and as the musician plays, Elisha prophesies this. And he said, This is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of trenches. For the Lord says this, You will not see wind, nor will you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you will drink, you, your livestock, and your other animals. And this is an insignificant thing in the sight of the Lord. He will also give the Moabites into your hand. Then you shall strike every fortified city and every choice city, and cut down every good tree, and stop up all the springs of water, and spoil every good plot of land with stones. Now, this seems like a great sign for Joram and his armies, and they do as Elisha says. The wadi is filled with water for their troops and animals, they drink and are revived, and the coalition proceeds into Moab, taking every city that stands in their way. And then we come to Mesha's last stand. And when it seems like Israel's forces will gain this final victory, Mesha offers his sacrifice and the Israelites turn back, stopping short of dethroning Mesha and subduing Moab. It seems that Elisha's prophecy was not fulfilled. So what do we make of that? Now, some of this prophecy is an ex some see this prophecy as an example of a lying spirit, similar to what we see in 1 Kings 22. Now there, a deceiving spirit prompts a prophet to prophesy something false to Ahab. Here in 2 Kings 3, Ahab's son is given a prophecy that seemingly doesn't come true. But this answer isn't entirely satisfactory. Others think that the original story ended in 2 Kings 3.25, and that 3.26 and 27 were later additions meant to explain why Moab is an independent in the 8th century and onward. But this again creates more problems than it solves. There isn't a strong linguistic argument for it, which you would like to see if you want to argue for a later editorial insertion. It seems that this was always a single literary unit. Still others think that the failure of the fulfillment of the prophecy lies on the Israelites, not Elisha or Yahweh. They theorize that the Israelite forces felt some kind of disgust or psychological failing when they witnessed the sacrifice of Mesha's son. And so it was their own wrath, or some psychologically induced frenzy, that drove them from the field of battle. It was their own failing, and possibly cowardice, that spared Mesha. But this is not really a culturally informed understanding. I doubt that Iron Age soldiers would be so squeamish as to flee the battlefield because their enemy killed his own son at the moment they were about to be victorious. Other scholars argue that Mesha sacrificed his son not to Chemosh, his own god, but to Yahweh. This is why the deity to whom he sacrifices is conspicuously absent from the text. The biblical authors would not want to record that their enemy prompted Yahweh to act on his behalf with a sacrifice that they viewed as reprehensible. Again, note Micah 6 here. Now, if this was the case, then the wrath amongst the Israelites would be Yahweh's, who was prompted to act on behalf of Mesha. Now, this resolves a few problems, but not all of them. The idea that the wrath that comes upon Israel is divinely provenanced seems clear. The phrase, a great wrath came upon them, appears elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible, and it always has a divine agent responsible for it. There's no reason to doubt that's the case here. But again, it doesn't resolve every question within the text. And it actually creates a few more. One idea that may support this theory comes from a scholar who has suggested that this is an attempt by Mesha to essentially cancel out the prophecy of Elisha, or a way to change his fate. He sees the writing on the wall, as it were, and he resorts to the most powerful ritual he knows to do, the sacrifice of his son. There are some interesting Mesopotamian rituals, the so-called Namburbi rituals, that were meant to counteract undesired oracles, but as with Ugra and Carthage, these are found admittedly pretty far afield from the southern Levant. The idea is that if a prophecy doesn't cut your way, you're in luck there are other rituals you can do to reverse course. While we don't have those kinds of texts from the Southern Levant, it's not out of bounds for their conception of the world. Mesha may be doing something similar here. He sees Yahweh has favored his enemies, so he resorts to the most powerful ritual he knows as an ad hoc act of desperation, and it works. But again, it's not clear to whom the sacrifice is directed. If this is what's happening, then we're still left to question which deity sent their wrath amongst the Israelites.
So while there's some cultural background here that may give some context, the passage itself is too ambiguous to say one way or another if this is how Mesha understood his sacrifice to function. Raymond Westbrook has made an interesting suggestion that Elisha's prophecy was a bit tricky. Without getting too deep into Hebrew grammar, he notes that in the prophecy Elisha gives, he says that Joram will strike every Moabite city. Now, depending on the case of the verb used, this could mean to destroy or to strike, two very different meanings. So this prophecy may be in line with the famous Delphic oracle that Croesus of Lydia received, that if you attack Persia, you will destroy a great empire. Croesus took this to mean that he would defeat Persia, but it actually meant that he would destroy his own great empire. So here, Elisha may have been tricky and convinced Joram he would destroy Moab, but instead he would just strike the great cities, something we see later in the passage when the slingers went to the last fortress and struck it. So the slingers made the prophecy technically correct, which is the best kind of correct. Every city was struck, even though not every city was destroyed. The issue here is that the prophecy also says he will give the Moabites into your hands, which strongly implies total victory. It also doesn't really account for what happens in verses 26 and 27 with the sacrifice and the wrath. There's another interesting idea from Raymond Westbrook and expounded on by Drew Holland that has suggested looking at vassal suzerain treaties in the Southern Levant for parallels to Mesha's sacrifice. We have seen that the text of the Meshastella seems to speak of Chemosh in comparable ways to that of how the Judahites spoke of Yahweh, and the cultic practices of the two nations were apparently not entirely dissimilar. Holland suggests we should look elsewhere in 2 Kings to make sense of this, not as far as field as Ugrit or Carthage. So in 2 Kings 18, Hezekiah rebelled against his suzerain, and when his rebellion failed, he appealed to Sennacherib and asked how to remedy the wrong he committed against him. Sennacherib asked for heavy financial tribute. And in 2 Kings 16, Ahaz sought the help of Tiglath Pileser III against his enemies in Israel and Damascus. After the Assyrians saved Ahaz, and after a substantial financial gift, Ahaz went to Tiglath Pileser in Damascus. In both cases, these rulers make their agreements directly, not through intermediaries. Westbrook and then Holland suggest we could understand Mesh's actions as an act of propitiation with his former suzerain. He has committed a sin against his former lord and offers a sacrifice as a form of forgiveness and reconciliation, as well as to his god for his breach of his oath. He presumably swore allegiance to Israel in the name of Chemosh, and to break that vow would have offended Chemosh, so he needed expiation from both his suzerain and his god. He offers a sacrifice as an olah, a burnt offering. Elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible, this is most frequently linked with contrition, particularly the sacrifice of a firstborn animal, something generally regarded as a substitute. And this is how burnt offerings are done elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible. The Israelites offer a burnt offering at Bethel after wartime losses in Judges 20. Samuel offers a burnt offering when the Philistines are threatening in 1 Samuel 7. And not only is the burnt offering made, but it's offered on the city wall, a visible place, something we don't see in other texts pertaining to child sacrifice. Uh, this may be relevant to the case of Mesha, as this is an agreement made directly between suzerain and vassal, not through intermediaries, just as we saw with Ahaz and Hezekiah. Mesha may be making a visible sign of atonement, sacrificing something of immeasurable value that even kind of stood in for himself to restore his relation with his suzerain. If this is the case, then Mesha's sacrifice is not primarily in a, to appeal to Chemosh for aid, but to appeal to Joram for mercy. There's definitely a cultic dimension to the sacrifice, but it is perhaps primarily an act of political reconciliation. Again, this may not be a definitive explanation, but it certainly works within the cultic and political framework of the Southern Levant in a way that the other theories and parallels really don't. So, here we have a number of theories about the significance of Mesha's sacrifice, and perhaps more significantly for us, about Elisha's prophecy. If the conclusions we've reached about Mesha's sacrifice are true, then we could also see that Elisha's prophecy was, in fact, fulfilled. Moab was defeated. The sacrifice of the son of Mesha was a tacit admission of defeat by Mesha. Though he survived to eventually lead an independent Moabite polity, Mesha's losses were tremendous, most of all the loss of his firstborn son and heir to preserve his own life and kingdom. The vassal suzerain reconciliation theory is the most satisfying to us. It explains a practical reason for Mesha's specific action sacrificing his firstborn son in full view of his approaching enemies, while rendering the cosmological ambiguity of the sacrifice intact, something that the biblical authors apparently wanted to convey. And at the same time, to view this truce as a technical defeat and the fulfillment of Elisha's prophecy is kind of unsatisfying, because we know that Moab did gain independence from its vassal relationship to Israel, 
That's a victory for Moab, plain and simple. So why was Israel defeated and Elisha's prophecy apparently thwarted when it looked like things were going their way so easily? Now, while the battle appears to turn on Mesha's sacrifice, I think the answer to Israel's defeat actually lies earlier in this chapter in the way that Joram is portrayed. He's not a good king. He's not even a sympathetic figure. He's explicitly said to have done evil in the sight of the Lord. The best thing the Bible has to say about him is that he wasn't as bad as his parents. But his parents were Ahab and Jezebel, so that's not much of a compliment. Joram blames Yahweh for his misfortunes on the way to war, and Elisha initially dismisses him, telling him to turn to the prophets of his father and mother instead. Now, overall, the message is clear. Why should Yahweh give Joram the victory if Joram does not honor or worship Yahweh and instead blames Yahweh for his problems? Yahweh does seem to aid Joram and his allies by providing water in the wilderness and paving the way for their initial victories into Moabite territory. But perhaps that's because of Jehoshaphat, not Joram, the same reason Elisha agreed to prophesy in the first place. In the end, for whatever reason, Yahweh stops short of helping Joram achieve his ultimate goal of subduing Moab completely. Now, while that turn of events is sudden, it shouldn't be unexpected. Israel's unfaithful kings simply do not succeed in the long run. Now, that's just the way the histories of Israel work. It's such a predictable outcome that kings can simply note it in one verse and move on. The reasons for Mesha's victory are not entirely clear whose wrath suddenly turns against the Israelites remains unstated. But one thing we know, it seems like the wrath of God was against Joram all along. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, we've included some references and resources in the description below. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more content like it, be sure to subscribe and check out our overviews of the Moabites and of the Iron II period when this story takes place. You can also check out our website, BeneathTheBible.com, and follow us on social media at Beneath the Bible. If you learned something new today, take a second to share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging.